All right. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, the Let Them Play podcast. I am one of your hosts here, Patrick Carr, joined by uh, Alec Horn and Joe Gustafson again. And one of our mottos from uh, the very first podcast, second episode we ever did was build the trenches. So it is pretty fitting that our first ever guest is uh, Niners tackle Mike McGlinchey. Special shout out to you and thank you so much for joining us. And how are you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. Um, so to get into it, uh, you were coming out of high school, you were a top 15 tackle and you had about, I think, 20 offers. And so when, and you're from Philly, correct? Yeah, I'm oh, right so, outside of Philadelphia in a town called Warrington, Pennsylvania. Warrington. So how did you end up in South Bend, Notre Dame? I mean, other than the fact that it's a great football school and a great school overall with tradition, so that might be it just right there. But how'd you end up there? Yeah, um, well, my last name's McGlinchey, and I grew up an Irish Catholic kid. And, and in Philadelphia, there was really only two teams you rooted for college-wise, and it was Penn State or Notre Dame. And um, I was I was a kid that was attracted to football from a young age, and um, Notre Dame is on TV every single Saturday on NBC. And uh, I fell in love with them when I was a kid. And um, when I started getting recruited, it was kind of a whirlwind. It was a really cool opportunity, really cool experience. But no matter what was going on, I was always waiting for Notre Dame. And if they were ever to come in, no matter what they said, I was, I was going to go there. And um, I, it's a little bit more complicated than that because when I when I was looking at it realistically, I it's, it was like about 11 hours from home. And I wasn't really super pumped about that idea because I have a huge family that I wanted to come see me play every week and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when I went out there for my first visit, my dad and I went out there and um, and in one week, and I knew that it was the only place I wanted to go to school, so I committed on the spot. Um, and uh, my mom said we would make it work, and we did. And it's been an uh, it's been an unbelievable. I mean, it's, that school gave me everything, man. It gave right. me my best friends. It gave me my degree. It gave me my football career. Um, I it's the best decision I ever made was to go to Notre Dame. So in the end, there probably really wasn't the closest second place for you then. Uh, well. Yeah, there was. I mean, I, I was I was getting recruited by Penn State too. And, right, like uh, you said, so the two. Only I was only and, and Boston College. I you know I had some family ties at BC, mm-hmm. um, and they were actually BC was actually my first offer. So um, I was I'd always loved them, and I've always I appreciated them always being re- recruiting me first. And um, I tried from the very beginning to to make sure that. Notre Dame was always in the forefront, but um, it was very likely that I could have went to Penn State as well, just to be close to home. Got it. Got it. That's well, like, I think it, like you said, it worked out pretty well for you. It did. I definitely, I definitely think I made the right call. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then another guy from Notre Dame, uh, we selected uh, Aaron Banks in the second round. Um, what would you think is like the most uh, impressive thing about his style of play for people well, that may not know? Yeah, he's a really gifted athlete. I, I know a lot of people were really uh, surprised by the pick of Aaron because of how big he is and the things that we do in our scheme and how much we have to run and all that kind of stuff. But he's a really, really gifted athlete, and he's a, he's a great mover. He's great in space, and he's a mauler. And he, um, he's going to be on you. He's going to be he's going to be big in pass protection and, and being stout in the middle. Um, he's a perfect fit for what we do. He's he's going to get up to speed here quick in OTAs and training camp and all that stuff, and hopefully can uh, compete to start at right guard, and we'll see what happens there. But um, we got a lot of guys that can play football, so he's going to have to earn his keep. Um, but he's he's done a good job thus far. He's going to continue to grow. we got a great O-line coach in Chris Furster, um, and, and I'm excited to see what Aaron can do for us. And it's great to – it's always great to be uh, alongside a domer and, and a fellow, oh, yeah. <laughs> guy, a fellow teammate. Um, so Aaron and I were teammates in 2017. So I've known him for, you know, five or six years now. And yeah. he's a great kid. That's good. He's as good of a guy as he is a football player, which is pretty cool. Yeah. You have got a lot of guys coming out of Notre Dame to play offensive line. Do you consider Notre Dame offensive lineman you? Yeah. What's in the water down there? I, I don't think it's up to me to determine that, but um, I think our track record speaks for itself. We've had Definitely. Uh, we've had five firsts, three seconds, and two thirds in the last seven years. So I don't think any other schools even come close to that. So um, we've won the Joe Moore Award in the in the process, and that's the for those who don't know, that's the offensive line unit of the year, mm-hmm. um, not just player. Um, which was pretty cool. We won it my fifth year, and they were finalists again this year. So. Um, we got a pretty good thing going and uh, we had a really, 
we had a really good coach at, at Notre Dame that that kind of brought us all in, all those guys that 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 have gone in and gone to had success in the NFL. Um, and Harry Heastan, and he's a guy that I genuinely probably owe the rest of my entire career to. He uh, he made me um, an NFL player and ready to play in the NFL. And um, fortunately, we'll have Chris Furster to help me take the next step. But um, wouldn't be where I am today without Harry. That's for sure. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask if there was a specific coach that yeah, he was our coach. He was, coach. Yeah. he was the coach for all five of my, my, my years at school. And I think the year before I got there. So his last year was my, was my fifth year. And the guys that had just gotten drafted were played for him for two or three years as well. This is, this, this last year was his last class of kids that he had, uh, mm. he had coached. Yeah. Pretty, pretty well credited coach there. Yeah. Wow. He does. He and, knows. Yeah. Stuff. And another thing we wanted to talk about was the the NFL draft. Obviously, everyone's draft process is different, so we were wondering if you could take us through yours a little bit. Yeah, so um, I obviously uh, I, I had contemplated staying um, in school, or I almost uh, contemplating leaving school. My fourth year um, had gotten a high grade from the NFL uh, draft board, or whatever that is. Um, but knew that I, I, I wasn't quite ready. I knew that I, I had a lot to improve on. I knew I had a lot to get better at before I was ready to play in the NFL. Um, and so I was really excited about the opportunity. And after my fifth year, um, my buddy Q and I had kind of solidified ourselves as the top two guys in the league yeah. or in the country mm -hmm. and, uh, and was, were fortunate to be picked in the top 10. Um, but uh, it, it was a wild process. You know, you get invited to the combine, you do all your pre-draft training. I fortunately uh, got to do it in San Diego, which was pretty cool. I got to live in San Diego for three months. It's not a bad deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a train. And so it, we, you know, training twice a day for three months, getting ready for the combine. You do your combine, then you do your pro day. The combine's a wild experience. You're, you know, you're literally on the move from six o'clock in the morning to 11 at night and, doing interview after interview after interview, which is stressful, but cool. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then you just kind of wait till draft day. And I, you know, I, I had no idea that I was getting picked by the Niners. So the surprise was, was pretty awesome when I found out that I knew I was coming out here. Um, and I had my, my party, my draft party at home. I wanted to be home with my family. I have a huge Irish Catholic family. That's all, all, all of us live in the same area. So I wanted all my aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents and friends from high school coaches to all be there. And um, so they, they were, and it was a great night. One of the best nights of my life. And yeah. I'll never forget it. I'll say when you and I first met a couple months ago, you were telling me on draft day, I think it was, you thought you were going to the Raiders at pick 10, right? Yeah. So I had gotten a call from, um, I had gotten a call from my agent on the golf course because I, I didn't want to sit around all day and wait because I was on the East Coast, so yeah. it wasn't 8, right. 8 p.m. And the jitter so, started already, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I didn't want to just sit around thinking about it all day. So I was playing golf, and my agent called me, and he said, hey, just got off the phone with uh, Reggie McKenzie, and if uh, if if, right. if you're there at 10, you're going you're gonna to be a Raider. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, I was kind of hoping I didn't go to the West Coast because it's far as hell for my family, yeah, but for this, you could be, right? Yeah. It, but, uh, it, it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened was to go on the left side of the Bay rather than on the right. Right. The, the other Bay team at that time. Yeah, exactly. Well then, uh, when you got drafted to the Niners, it's pretty well documented, or at least you, you and, um, this person I'm going to ask you about have talked about it, but how big of a mentorship did Joe Staley play to you? He was huge, man. Um, he, he's become one of my best friends, which is pretty cool. But before that, Joe was like, uh, Joe was like my idol growing up. Like I, when I figured out that I was going to play offensive line, he was the first guy that I kind of started paying attention to and, and looking at and studying. And um, turns out that Joe also played college football for Brian Kelly at central oh. Michigan and had all of my same strength coach. Like he had my strength coach he had a couple other coaches on his staff that I all, that I played for as well. Um, so our, our, our stars were kind of aligned in a, in a weird way. Um, and then the first two years, you know, he was, he was, he's, he was my best friend and mentor for, well, he still is my best friend, but um, he was my football mentor for two years. And he, he, he took me under his wing, showed me the ropes um, and allowed me to, uh, you know, really start growing as a player and understanding how the NFL works. And um, 
still, I still see Joe all the time. I we fly in and out of and hang out with each other all the time. And um, he's as good of a guy as, as he is a player, um, which is pretty hard to do because he's, I, I, I would argue that he's one of the best to ever do it. Um, but he's, uh, he's, he's a really, really, really great person. And uh, I'm very thankful to have had him, you know, be here when I first got here. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we've been kind of spoiled with our left tackles recently. You know, we've had Joe Staley like our whole life. Not uh, bad. And not now bad. Yeah, yeah, not Trent Williams. From, yeah, not bad to go from Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer, right? Yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, it's a pretty good luxury to have if you're the San Francisco 49ers. Exactly. Um, and then another new uh, lineman that we uh, got this year is Alex Mack. Um, how important is the center position in general to the Shanahan offense, and how do you think Alex Mack fits that role? I think – uh, the center is probably the most important position on the line. Um, I think he he is the guy that is going to get us all on the same page. He's responsible for making all the calls in the run run game and protection. Him and the quarterback are on the same page in all that regard. He's a he's a he's a big leader. Um, he's been a leader everywhere he's ever been, and he's an unbelievable guy. I've, it's been cool to be to have worked with Alex these last couple of weeks, and um, his game speaks for himself. He's been one of the best centers to ever play. Um, Kyle was a huge fan of him, obviously bringing him here. He, he, had, he had him in Cleveland and in Atlanta. That's right. Uh, and so Alex is a favorite of Kyle's as well and, 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 and is super excited to have him on board. Um, and we're, you know, he's, he makes our line better. I, I um, unfortunately lost Weston mm-hmm. uh, to injury for the last two years. And so um we had we had a void and we needed to fill it and we filled it with a great player. So um, we're very fortunate to have Alex in our building now. I'm very excited to see him get on the field and training camp and cut it loose. Definitely. Um, also, I just wanted to going back to your family, how important it is, you know, uh, being around them. We also uh, we know that we're going to have full capacity fans and people back in the stadium. Um, how excited are you to finally get fans back and um, get that in-game interaction? I'm juiced up, man. It, yeah. it, it was it was absolutely bizarre playing football in front of nobody last year. Yeah. Um, but very happy to have that happen. Very happy that our are the powers that be at the 49ers, Levi Stadium, and Santa Clara County have figured out a way to make that happen. Um, it's uh, it doesn't feel right playing on Sundays without everybody screaming and cheering for us and. Um, the energy that the fans bring, the way that we, you know, the celebrations that we can get, it just makes the game that much better. And it's why football is the greatest game in the world is because it, it, it attracts all different types of people, all different t- types of walks of life. But uh, it's the most exciting thing that you can possibly watch. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's what's the greatest thing about it to play and to, pl- and to watch. And um, it doesn't, like I said, it didn't feel right without everybody there. Yeah, I think yeah. I mentioned in one of like our recent podcast episodes, like I underestimated how important, I guess, impactful the fans really were. Uh, I oh absolutely. My goodness. Yeah. yeah like watching I, these I, NBA playoffs, seeing the, the garden pack, I was like, wow, I forgot what it was like. So I, I mean, what was this COVID year even like with how crazy it was, you know, off the field and, and I bet even on the field? Yeah, it was awful. Um, it was not fun. Um, we were, we were in a lot of different uh, protocols and things like that to make sure that, things went the, smoothly within the league and that we could operate and have a season. Um, but that meant sacrificing a lot. We weren't mm-hmm. able to really, a lot of my teammates and, and, and myself included, we didn't see our families for the whole year. We didn't get to go home. We didn't get to um, have anybody around us. We didn't get to have anybody travel in. We didn't get to see, uh, we didn't get to eat with, with our teammates every night. They took, they took our tables out of our cafeteria um, and then they moved us to Arizona, which was even right. worse. Um, we literally only came out of our room to play football. And that was kind of a weird deal. Felt like the longest yard a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was all good. You know, we had, a, and it was a tough year because guys just kind of kept getting hurt too. Um, so we had, a, we had about as bad a luck as you could have last year. Hopefully that's all behind us and we've paid our penance for whatever, uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever happened in 19 and, and the year that we had there. So hopefully we can get back on track and, and go after another Super Bowl. Good, sure, because your guys like last five home games, quote unquote, weren't even in. Yeah, we had, yeah, we had we were scheduled to have all of our games at home pretty much the entire month of December. And That's we right. spent, we spent all of them in, uh, in, in Arizona, including <coughs> excuse me, Christmas and New Year's. 
and like I said, Christmas New Year's locked up like that is definitely yeah, it was not 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 ideal. But I mean, no. No, but we were for we at, at the end of the day we were fortunate we got to have our jobs we got to play our we got to play games and um, in that aspect that was great. But it it, it definitely didn't feel like a uh, like a normal job at any point. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, you talked a little bit about 2019, and you you know you got the opportunity to play in a Super Bowl. You know, sadly it didn't end in the result you wanted. But what was it like playing in the Super Bowl? Uh, it's the coolest thing ever. Um, it's it's uh, it's one of those things that you still have to pinch yourself to 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 feel like you did it. Um, that whole season was magic, man. Um, from starting eight zero to making the run that we did in the playoffs. I'll never forget looking at, at Joe and, and the rest of our O line um, in the NFC Championship game against the Green against Green Bay and the job that we did that day. Oh, yeah, um, we, know, we, rushed, yards, we rushed. We rushed, for, we rushed. We rushed for three hundred some yards, scored forty points to their eight, and our defense was lights out. And you know, there's ten minutes left in the game which in the NFL is a lot, a long time. And you look, is, at, yeah. you look at each other and you're like, holy shit, we're going to the Super Bowl. And that feeling, and I still, t- I tell people that story and I still get chills down my spine thinking about it because it's literally the moment that you've been waiting for and working for since you were a child. And mm-hmm. um, everybody thinks that, you know, it, and it's the hardest thing to do. It's one of the rarest things to do is to be able to play and win a Super Bowl. And uh, it's the hardest thing to do in any sport, I think. I agree. It's yeah, it's the hardest team sport to play because there's so many variables that take place and you have to be your best on command one time, one game, all season. And um, to have that accomplishment um, is, is one of the coolest things ever. But it's also the worst feeling ever when you lose it. So uh, hopefully next hopefully next time I get there, I'll come out, win, uh, come out winning it. Yeah, it goes the other way. Exactly. Yeah. Another I, thing that uh, – us fans are really excited about is that we really still have that roster from 2019 minus a couple pieces. So um, that's something that uh, we're really looking forward to is just getting back onto the field. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of really, really talented core guys, uh, Mm -hmm. guys that have grown up and matured since 19 as well. Um, The only, the only thing is that we just got to stay healthy. We just got to stay healthy and we got to compete and we got to be ready to play and um, I think we've taken a lot of steps and strides to be able to do that this year, which um, we're all really excited about. Yeah, I mean, as of uh, right now, OTAs are going on. And uh, so once you let us know or let the, I guess the fans who don't really know what really goes on during OTAs. So like, what is the a typical day in the life for you at the moment? Uh, so I get up around 530, uh, 530 or 545. I drive into work, um, do our, you know, all my, uh, prep work for my body, eat some breakfast, get ready to go. We, we lift as an offensive line at seven 30 every day. Um, and then we go into meetings at nine and then we have meetings until about 1130. And then, um, we go out on the practice field and, and practice. And so it's been, uh, it's been really cool to have everybody back in the building. I know not, all, not, every, not every NFL team can say the same, which I'm very proud uh, of our team and our leadership to get that done. Yeah, that was a big topic this offseason. Um, because because I think um, I think it's absolutely necessary to have an offseason. I think mm-hmm. um, to only show up and play football in August is crazy. I don't think it's a healthy thing to do. I think guys get hurt that way. And um, I also know that it it, it, it affects the, the progress of the game by not allowing guys to get better. So um, I know our team is chomping at the bit with the opportunity to practice and play and get ready to play football. And, um, you know, we're ready. We'll, we'll, we'll finish up here in the next two weeks and then um, have a couple have a couple weeks off and get ready to get our minds right for training camp. Yeah, yeah as you mentioned, oh, go ahead. I don't think people realize as much that the work really begins way before August. Yeah, it starts as soon as, as it starts pretty much as soon as the last season's over. You take about a week or two to get your body right, to heal up a little bit, and then you start moving again and you start getting ready to, lift and train and get your body ready to go for practice and OTAs. Then you play OTAs and you play and get your craft right for the season. And as it's coming up and then you hit the ground running in training camp and it's all, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's balls to the walls for the next six or seven months after that. So 
um, it's been, it's been, it's been fun to be able to have that process, but yeah, absolutely. Football starts pretty much a week or two after the last season ends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are in OTAs right now, chain camp coming up. Um, with the amount of talent that the Niners have on the defensive line and also the offensive line, um, how much do you think that competition really um, helps prepare you for the regular season? And is there a player that you're most looking forward to, you know, practice against? Um, well, yeah, I, I, we have the phrase here, iron sharp iron. And um, oh, yeah. so when you have a talented level like we have, I, I, you know, Trent obviously being, I think, the best in the world at playing tackle, um, Alex and Lakin being upper echelon at their positions. And um, no matter who the, our right guard is, is a de- damn good football player. And I like to think of myself as a pretty good one, too. And so um, our defensive line is as talented as it gets in the, in, in the league. And to be able to go up against those guys every single day um, is, is a huge plus for us. It's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge to be able to withstand the force that they bring every single day. But at the end of the day, all it's doing is getting us better. And uh, I can't wait for Bosa to be back and healthy and so we can start, oh, yeah. uh, start going at it again. Well, I, get his, I get his brother in training camp, too. We just got, we just got announced. That, oh, yeah. Uh, just got announced that we're, uh, we're going down to play the training camp, so – well, to, to bounce off that one, then who would you say? I mean, Nick uh, can be included. Who would you say like the three to five hardest edge defenders are to block? Um, I yeah, I'd say both both the brothers are mm-hmm. in there. Um, Chandler Jones in Arizona. Um, I think Khalil Mack in Chicago and 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 Von Miller in Denver. Um, I think those five probably do it. I don't. I, I obviously I think JJ Watt is is as good of a his one of the greats of all time, but I don't really know really an edge defender. Mm -hmm. Um, And Aaron Donald, I think is the greatest player in football period. No, no, no doubt about it. Um, I see him on the edge every now and again, but he's, he's most bad guy. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, When uh, you and I first met, I think it was the day before the NFL draft and all off season, was I think the Niners probably were the biggest story all off season with, you know, who are they going to pick at number three? And you told me you didn't know, you know, you, they weren't telling you who they were going to pick at number three. Were you shocked? And also how, how are things going with the, with the rookie and Trey Lance? Uh, no, I wasn't shocked. I, I, I uh, you don't trade all that for a non quarterback. So you knew mm-hmm. they were going quarterback. I didn't know which one it's not my, it's thankfully I'm not paid to make roster decisions. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure, but um, no, he's been, he's looked great. Trey's a great talent, great kid, um, which is really exciting. And he, he's, he's only 21 years old. He just turned 21 last or two or three weeks ago, which is insane. Um, but he's, he's looked great in, in, in practice and he's, he's an unbelievable fit in our locker room. Mm-hmm. Um, guy's the limit for him. I can't wait to see what he, uh, what he does with his career. That's that's exciting, definitely. And it's like yeah. with his mobility, it'll be interesting to block for him too. Yeah, well, we're right now we're still I'm still blocked for number 10. So we'll exactly, see how- yeah, that's true. It's a good battle going on, supposing mm-hmm. from what I've been reading. Yeah. And then also um speaking about the draft, did you have any kind of hinge um that they might go guard in the second round or that they were gonna yeah. take your former teammate? Yeah, I knew that I was going to get one of them. I, I didn't know which Notre Dame guy, but I knew uh-huh. we were one of them. Yeah, they Kyle and John had kept me in the loop that uh, that's who they were going after. And I, I knew they were going to go one of my team, one of my former teammates at that. I didn't know which one, but uh, they asked me about all of them. So I was I was yeah. ready to I was ready to have all of them. Doesn't seem like you can go wrong over there in Notre Dame. So. Yeah, in South Bend. It, doesn't, yeah. it, doesn't, it absolutely doesn't go wrong. <laughs> That's a good start. I always look, let's any team that needs O-line would always go to South Bend first. That's the first call. Yeah. Good. That's a good philosophy for winning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were talking about, you know, you were golfing the day of, uh, you know, draft day. And I know from seeing, seeing you post by, you know, I talked about when we met, what's your, what's your handicap? I'm like a five and a half right now. Okay. Uh, better than me. <laughs> what'd you say? Way better than me. Oh, well, I've, I fortunately get to play a lot. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not a dad yet. I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not married yet. So I, I still get to play a lot of golf. I live in California so I can play all year round. Um, uh, unfortunately this time when we're practicing, I, the, the golf stops a little bit until the weekend hits, but um, it's been, it's been fun. I, since I moved out to California 
my golf game has certainly taken a big step up and, uh, and, and, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's my favorite thing to do. Oh, uh, yeah. if, I, I don't know, if I'm not in a weight room or on a football field or anything like that, you'll catch me on the golf course for sure. Interesting. Yeah. West Patrick's Coast. been doing it for a while. I kind of just got started golfing. Um, I just went down to Palm Springs and it's just beautiful down there. It's I've amazing. Been down to Palm Springs, but a buddy of mine's headed there this week. He told me it's one of the best places you can golf in the country. So oh, I easily. Yeah. Yeah, it is the most beautiful, frustrating sport. I tell you, man. Oh my it, goodness! But it's a, it's a, it's that's why you keep coming back. It's, it's exactly. Like, it's like one day you can watch. One day you can go out and shoot seventy-five, and then the next one you can shoot ninety-five. It's unbelievable. Oh yeah, that's where. Well, I mean, you didn't really get to experience it with the um, the COVID season, but where you were in Arizona is another great spot for that. Yeah, I actually did. I got out a couple. Of- rounds of golf while i was down there oh you were that's good that's good yeah. you need that especially when you're locked up for like yeah that, that's that's longest that's yard. That's a mental break for sure yeah um are you a big basketball fan huge yeah huge? Huge. who's your team uh the sixers are my team i'm from philly so i, I root for that's the right sixers. that makes sense yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. my cousin my, my cousins and brothers and i have this uh have our group chat obviously just because we're related and everything but I feel like the entire entirety of the topics of conversation revolve around the 76ers where our family is the biggest Sixers fans of all time. It's crazy. Especially with this team right now too. I mean, you guys, yeah, you good. I, I, you know, just praying to God that Joel, Joel's knee is okay. Um, exactly, yeah. Cause they're, they're so close to, to taking it and, and, and their team is, they put, they're playing so well and um, hopefully they can get him back because um, I don't know if there's a I don't know if there's a player other than maybe Steph Steph Curry. I don't know if there's a player more important to his basketball team than Joel Embiid. So hopefully he can uh, hopefully he can bounce back in the next week or two and uh, get another great series against the Hawks. Especially this, yeah, season. it was a huge win to get a win without Joel Embiid. He didn't yeah. have to risk his. Yeah, it gives them an extra couple of days of rest before he has to go back in. So hopefully it uh, hopefully it'll work out in their favor. Um, you know, just, just, just can't, just can't guarantee a win in the NBA anymore, which is, which is tough, but it's, it's exciting. How are you feeling confidence wise with or without him this next series? Uh, I'm very, com- I'm, I'm still very confident even with the Hawks series. Um, mm-hmm. the Sixers still match up incredibly well for what the Hawks do. I think, um, Ben Simmons can guard any position on the floor. Tobias Harris is a great three and D guy. D- Danny Green's a lockdown defender. People people don't really know, but Matisse Thibel probably could have been a defensive player of the year candidate if he had a bigger name. He's active. He's unbelievable. He's, He's active. active. So I don't worry about their D. You just worry about the way they can score the basketball. But now that they have, you know, they, they were lacking it in the last couple of years, which is why they kept getting stopped in the semis. Is, uh, they have spacing like no other because of st- – uh, the uh curry's brother seth yeah, seth and just Danny. had a big game yeah Danny yeah. Green, burkhan cork Maz, those guys can light it up from three so um it definitely helps out that they can still score the basketball so i i, I like it against the hawks it'll be really hard to beat the, the Bucks next one that. yeah without without joel so hopefully they can bounce back the three of us on our nba awards podcast two or three weeks ago we all picked ben simmons as defensive player of the year actually so we've got yeah. you there. He's a stud, but the, the Sixers are the best defensive team in basketball. They just mm-hmm. have to – because because Joel, when he's in, is, a, is an unbelievable uh, oh, yeah. rim defender and stuff. So, he gives Rudy Gobert a run for his money every year too. So, um, you know, just got to get him on the floor. That's all That's all that matters. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Just I'd give my, him a good, you know. Yeah, exactly. Only for a little bit, though. Don't let yeah. – uh, I'll let them lease it until the fall. There you go. That's a good call. Yeah. Um, maybe last one here before we let you go. I'm sure you've got a lot of stuff planned. But, you know, you said you were East Coast your whole life until Notre Dame, now you're on the West Coast. Which coast Which coast is the best coast? Um, it's They're so different. Um, obviously, I have an allegiance to the East Coast because my family and everybody's still there. But it, it, I like living on the West Coast a lot better than I like living on the East Coast. <laughs> that's fair. I do love, as somebody who grew up with uh, all four seasons, I think they're overrated. I really like <laughs> Sunshine. Well, so. I'm fine with the two we get here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, I, actually. I, I, what, what's the second one? I We get spring and summer, and that's pretty much it. 
Oh, no, that's what I'm saying. Spring and summer. That's what you get. We go, we, go, we go summer and then it starts turning into a springtime in like November. And then you can, it's like Which the best, two, it's the best thing ever. Yeah. You know, I don't need snow. I lived in East Coast for years I, and I'm over. I don't need any of it. I don't need yeah. to be cold. I don't need to be, I want to be able to play golf in January, you know, mm, so yep. it all. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I actually went back and looked at your first Instagram post and it was in 2013 and it was saying, waiting for spring and it was it was uh really snowy out there yeah oh. it snows all the time i went back uh i went back to visit my family after the season and uh, i was there for two weeks and got snowed on five times so it's uh it's not not an ideal spot to be in the, in the middle of the winter yeah, it's, it gets you know the worst is when you're walking outside and your fingers just hurt just walking or your eyebrows yeah, just not, hurt not ideal no, no it's it, and south bend is even colder which is crazy i it's it's funny to look it's it's funny to think about now that I'm I live in California full time and everything because I used to be like I used to think like 40 degrees was shorts shorts and a t-shirt weather because of where right. I went to college. We're bundling but, up for that now. Oh my god, oh, yeah. I got the heat cranked to 80 when it's that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I know we know how that one is. I mean, yeah. I go to school uh, in Arizona and I came back over springtime and it was like 70 degrees. So I'm like, it's just cold, man. Like, yeah. That that's a little ridiculous, I think. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but where is, I that, went, that was a wake up call when it was 110 my degrees. Fresh, like... my, freshman year, my freshman year at Notre Dame, we we uh, we didn't get over zero degrees Fahrenheit for 40 days straight. Oh my yeah. god! Okay. It is, it, it's one of the coldest towns you can be in in America. It's probably it's... there, below New York, and maybe a couple towns in Minnesota. That's I was gonna say it. maybe like. No, nah, Madison doesn't get like that year round, does it? Well, it might because it's on anyone that's on the water in the lakes is is, is freezing. That's what like, something you want to visit, like on a vacation, than live in. Summertime there is great. Summertime yeah. there is awesome. like Chicago in the summertime is one of the best places you could ever be. But, but does it get but, does it get humid in that area too, or no? Bad because you're on the water, pretty okay. much. You're okay, but anytime anytime past October, get the hell out of town. <laughs> good to know if we're ever playing in a visit you know we'll go to a football game before then well we played yeah. we played chicago on halloween thank god it was uh early i was sweating i was sweating so worried about that one. yeah <laughs> that's right that's like week seven or week eight at that point yeah something like that yeah that's right that's yeah. what do you think about the new 17 game season oh yeah that's a, that was a big uh, um you know it it is what it is i i didn't really um I guess I just had, I got to play one more game. I, I never really gave too much thought about it. I'll play as many games as they ask us to play. Um, so it's one more game, one more exciting week to get an extra edge on the playoffs and stuff like that. So um, it keeps it keeps people in it alive longer and um, another chance to for for teams to make a run at it. So I'm all for it. Yeah, that's yeah. Gonna, I, would, I thought they should have added a second bye week personally for each team, but. Yeah, well, then then you start getting into the season. The se- the regular season doesn't start stop until just about February. So yeah, that's true. You gotta you gotta be careful with that. Mm-hmm. Hey, but if you you're sixteen and zero, yeah, I definitely don't need the football turn the football turning into the MLB. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. The one sixty two. That's why I didn't I didn't mind the short MLB season at all because it was like competitive from game one. Some point, no doubt. Yeah, I was I was all about that. Yeah, I wonder – I am definitely interested. I mean, you know, one game addition is going to definitely have effects on the standings, and especially in your guys' division, which is so loaded this coming year. I wonder – there's a good chance we come down to week 18 at this point, and week 18 matters. Yeah, so we're down in L.A. week 18, so that'll be a uh, probably a hard, a hard, pretty hard matchup for us, which will be exciting. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll mm-hmm. be one yeah, for I night. think I'm going to try to buy tickets to the, the home game against L.A. Hey, that's uh, the uh, one well, I'm most looking forward to. That the Sunday night game, mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be good. That's a lot of fun. Well, um, thank you so much, Mike. We can't yeah, say thank you enough great. for joining us. Had to do it. Um, wish you a super healthy and successful season this year. Uh, I, I have a pretty good feeling. I think the Niners are going to be pretty good. I, I may put a little bit on you guys over. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enjoy it, guys. All right, good luck, man. See thank, you. You. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you uh, to Mike McGlinchey for joining us. Um, that was a pretty awesome interview, huh, guys? Definitely. It was awesome. That yeah, was great. Yeah, he's he's uh, 
you know, sometimes people joke about like class acts and stuff, like his definition of a class act. Um, Before we go, we've got tonight when we're recording this, we've got uh, Lakers Suns at 730 and uh, Nuggets Blazers at 430. Any predictions? Uh, you know, as the resident Lakers fan, it's not looking good. I feel like it's kind of like I was talking to Patrick earlier. I said, I feel like it's kind of like a lose-lose for Anthony Davis because if he doesn't play, he gets the whole, oh, always injured soft thing, even though it's a groin injury, which we've seen players get taken out for a long time from that type of injury. But if he does play, I mean, there's a huge chance he does get injured even worse and they still could lose, which would just – be terrible for the off season. I saw um, a doctor's report talking about because it, it was earlier in the year when he hurt his Achilles, correct? Yeah. And they called this the kinetic chain. Is a this was like a, do- a legit doctor's report. They called it the kinetic chain. You hurt your Achilles first, and then he went on to having was it ankle or knee first? I don't remember which one he had issues with. Man, it's been everything. It, it, he's, he's had a bang, but I, I think I believe it went. It goes Achilles first, ankle, knee, and then groin is the fourth part of the chain. And like the doctor was talking about, it's just as an overcompensation, you know, issue. And so it's just too bad. For That's how people get hurt the most is when they're trying to play, you know, too early yeah. coming off an injury. They overcompensate one side or a we can look muscle. At Durant two years ago in the finals, and we saw how that would happen there with the yep. calf. And then the, yeah, it's just brutal for NBA players to come back during the playoffs off injury. It's just it, no, it's so how quick. different the physicality is and the intensity. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I think the uh, the Lakers actually get Game Six tonight. Uh, they let's say we could say they probably gave up a little early in Game Five and that thirty point blowout. But I think tonight everyone does joke about you know we're, oh we're getting a LeBron super game tonight. I actually do think LeBron was holding his chips in a little bit Game Five and he was holding it all for this performance. And I think. Yeah. He's going to come out and empty the clip. And if, you know, he goes down swinging, he goes down swinging. But I think I think he's definitely going to give him a really good shot tonight. I'd, yeah. I'd agree with that. My uh, my mind's in the offseason already, if that's how you – it's if that says anything about – It's better to feel. prepare for the worst, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I would know. Celtics are already out, so. Yeah, well, I don't know. The three, team, three basketball teams on this podcast are going to be done by round two. That's too bad. With the uh, with the earlier game, it's you know Blazers Nuggets Nuggets up three two. We were joking about this earlier that that series is a contractual obligation to go seven. I think the Blazers get this one tonight just because it's in Portland. It was a double overtime game, you know, two nights ago, and uh, the Nuggets tend to uh, especially Jokic when he plays like fifty five minutes like that or fifty minutes whatever he play, he's gonna be worn out tonight. I just don't think the Nuggets have the firepower for it tonight. Yeah, and I think Dame's teammates really kind of let him down. Everyone was talking about it, but they did. So I think they're going to just go extra hard tonight, and we'll see. Yeah, I just think they need to – they had the opportunities to hit those shots. They just need to actually hit those shots to, you know, pull out a win. Well, it should be an exciting night of basketball. Um, we'll probably be back very soon to preview, I think, an all-time historic potential round two series between uh, Brooklyn and Milwaukee. I think that's, you know, I can't wait to discuss that with you guys soon. And hopefully the rest of round one will be wrapped up by then. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in, listening to, uh, you know, a great interview from Mike Lynch, like I already said. And, you know, I'm going to thank him one more time because we can't thank him enough. But thank you to Mr. McGlinchey for letting this happen and making this happen for us. Yep.